Peter Merholz, big round of applause. Design and product leader for more than 25 years, co-founded Adaptive Path, wrote a book on org design for design orgs. And if you don't know Peter, and you don't know that the talk title you know, is giving away that it'll be full of surprises and even more learnings. Another round of applause for Preet. Thank you. Thank you. This is a lot of work. This is largely a volunteer effort. Uh, I love coming to this event because of the community. Preet is an amazing community organizer, so thank you for all your effort, and thank you to all of the, the volunteers who are helping us uh, put on the show. Okay, so I changed the talk title a little bit because design leadership, there is leading design involved with it, but uh, I, I call it design leadership is more than leading design or as a uh, citizen of the San Francisco Bay Area, design leadership is hella more than leading design. Um, I work with a lot of design leaders in my job. I'm an independent consultant. I support design organizations uh, be their most effective, and I help design leaders as well try to be their most effective. And what I hear from design leaders, um, particularly in the past year and a half, but even before then, are, are things like, why am I teaching other people their job? Why, do I, why can't I just focus on what I'm doing? Why do I have to teach product managers how to do discovery or talk to customers? Um, why do I have to communicate my value? My leadership doesn't understand what we, my team, does. The business keeps changing its mind. They ask for a vision, but when I show it to them, they say, nah, no, not that. I, I just want to lead creative work. We're not given time to do things right. This is more from the directors who are like, we, we need a VP of design. We need someone in here who, who people will listen to. We're in a period of change. Uh, coming to this event, though I've been using this quote for many years, uh, a couple years before today, so it was, uh, th that's a coincidence. Um, I had the opportunity, uh, yeah, about a couple years ago, as part of my podcast that I co-host with Jesse James Garrett to interview Katrina uh, uh, when she was running design at IBM. And in the podcast, she shared a bit of wisdom. I don't if know. If okay. design was fully understood and recognized and invested in, we would not need to be change agents. We would need to be good stewards. We would need to do the main part of our job description, drive human-centered processes, collaboratively solve complex problems that win in the market. <laughs> I think we're change agents because all of us doing this are still part of a movement to change how businesses work, how they run. This is why you, uh, all those questions, <laughs> This is why it's so much more than what you thought the job was, is because you are all, are all having to be change agents. So kind of following on what Katrina said, there's what's in the job description, but then the reality is <laughs> there's the work, the actual work to be done. In, in her case, change how businesses are run. And there's a big gap. And something I've found that many, particularly new design leaders, have trouble realizing is that most of their work is not in that job description because it's the undefined work. If it had been defined, it would be in the job description and you would be a steward and it would be straightforward. But because we're kind of, I don't want to say making it up as we go along, but, but driving change, uh, we don't know what the work is going to be to do that. And so your work of leadership is the undefined work. That's not, that's not separate from your job, all, answering all those questions or dealing with all those concerns that I shared earlier. That's not separate from your job. That is the job. Herbert Simon, Nobel laureate, wrote a, a, a classic uh, work on design called The Sciences of the Artificial. And in there he has this quote, everyone designs who devises courses of actions aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. And one, one of the reasons I like this is it has the word change or changing in it, right? Designers are always operating at that state of change. That's, that's, how we, that's just where we live. But also, we can't help ourselves. We're, we're terrible at being stewards because we, can, we all see the problems that are out there and want to make them better. Uh, as designers, that's like our motivating force. And so we can't help ourselves. The problem is when we insert ourselves trying to make things better, uh, we end up feeling a little bit like uh, this person. All right? And that's, your, that's you as the, the designer UX leader in the middle. And you're getting pulled in all these directions. There's your team uh, needing things from you, trying to figure out how to grow in their career or getting good, you know, access to good work. There's your product partner who is pulling you in another direction. Uh, uh, or you're trying to help them change how they actually uh, uh, go about their product development processes. Your dev lead, 
Uh, they have their requirements or, or uh, that they need. Your boss has their demands. Of course, then there's always this shadowy figure of the business somewhere that actually controls everything. And then in the back, just pumping the bellows, not really helping out our, our friends in HR. I'm sorry if you're in HR. I'm, this is just, I'm making fun. Um, but, but the reality, and I, I wrote an article about a year ago that used this image, and it resonated very strongly with a lot of people. Many of us as design and UX leaders are, are feeling like we're, we're being stretched way too thin. And it's because of all that, that, that requirement of, of leadership. So the question is, how can we kind of situate ourselves or orient ourselves? And so through my work through the podcasts and the interviews that we've conducted with design leaders, my work with other design leaders directly, I'm going to share just what I've seen in terms of what, what I see successful leaders do. Uh, there's probably more to it than I'm showing here. I'm going to have to speed run through some of it. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful I'm giving you a bit of a framework for thinking about uh, your work of leadership. And the very first thing, A number one, that you as a design leader need to be uh, considering is, is the, uh, developing an agenda. Leadership begins with an agenda. You cannot lead if you don't have a sense of where you are leading people to. You have to be very clear what is the change that you seek? What is that difference you want to make? And be explicit about it. Put it out there. So what do I mean by an agenda? Uh, it can take various forms. It can be new ways of working. Right? How can, how can your uh, uh, team or, or cross-functional teams operate with new process or methodology such as dual track agile or whatever it is you're trying to introduce? It could be a vision. Um, I, uh, it could be some concrete, that, that North Star, that concrete depiction of that future state experience. Uh, what I'm showing here are the pill bottles that Deborah Adler designed as a master student at SVA that became the Target Clear RX system, and now CVS is still uh, riffing on this 15, 20 years later, right? But, but a prototype, some vision of, of that future experience. Or um, it could be a statement of impact, some specific, measurable, successful outcome. For example, to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. John F. Kennedy speaking in 1961 in a State of the uh, Union speech uh, where he set out what became the, uh, the, the, the moon missions. Um, it's a very clear, <laughs> like you know if we were successful or not, did by 1969, were we able to send someone to the moon and return them safely to the Earth? Turns out, yes, we did. So, you know, he, he met his OKR. Um, uh, but, but, yeah, yours might not be as grand, but you need something there. Some, again, what is, what is that change that you're, that you're driving toward? As you're thinking about agendas, just uh, something to keep in mind, they can be nested. Uh, Karen Hansen, who's here, uh, was one of the guests on our podcast, and she shared, she didn't frame it the way I'm about to frame it, but she shared, uh, she had some insights into how she was approaching her role as the chief design officer at Chase Bank. And um, the, one, of, one thing she shared is that <laughs> her ultimate goal uh, for the bank is to deliver one freaking experience. And she made sure to use the word freaking because, you know, you gotta, got to keep it clean for the kids. Um, and, but the reality is at a place like Chase Bank, hundreds of thousands of employees, very complex. In order to deliver on this, you actually, at least in the United States, need to change regulation. Uh, so you need to get the government involved, et cetera. This is going to be a very long-term vision. Um, but then she also shared this set of initiatives that she had, uh, was undertaking that laddered up to what I would uh, call um, a more midterm agenda of design a strategic contributor. And she shared how she was initiate, you know, building up a senior team, uh, crafting that senior team in order to support and nurture relationships with uh, executives throughout the firm, establishing a UX metrics practice, and then bringing in training to evolve the product development practice, right? So, so she, and, and like, Karen can correct me if I'm wrong when she's on stage later today, but uh, you know the sense we got in our conversation with her, she kind of showed up having a pretty firm understanding of what it was that she was trying to drive towards. Not that she wasn't paying attention to the context around there, but um, uh, she came in with the plan, a clear plan, and three years later is delivering on it. So you need an agenda. You need some direction that you're pointing people to. Once you've got that vision in mind, 
I'm going to spend a fair bit of time talking about, you need to understand the context in which you're operating. I think this is something that we uh, fail at, uh, uh, not as just design leaders, but as people supporting design leaders, really helping design leaders situate themselves in the space that they are in. Because you are not going to be able to make change if you don't understand your context. So that's you, the design leader. One bit of context, something that we hear about all the time, especially if you're on LinkedIn, people love talking about design maturity, but there's a reason. Your ability to affect change is going to be constrained or enabled by your organization's design maturity. I have here a very simple maturity model uh, uh, of that, that, and you know, your, your job right now is to figure out where you are on here. You're probably not in the incompetent unconscious quadrant of don't understand design, don't really want it, or else you probably wouldn't be here. If your company was there, they wouldn't have supported you coming here. You might be, and I would argue that well over 50% of the companies that I work with, support, see, understand, et cetera, are in, they're conscious, they know that design matters, they, they have some sense that they should have it, but they're incompetent, they don't know what what to make of it. They don't know how to value it, right? So the superficial awareness of design, they cannot connect behavior, right? Because design is about changing behavior. They are unable to, to connect behavior with value. Where, you, where most people will hope to get and would be a perfectly good place to be is operating in a space where that business has an explicit understanding of the business value of design. They are able to connect the work that your team does with business value so that you can advocate for it. When someone asks you about your impact, you can show them. You can, you can, you can make that clear. And then, you know, a, a vaunted few <laughs> will get to the highest uh, level of uh, uh, where you're competent but unconscious. You no longer have to be explicit about it because design is just unquestioned. It's just seen as core to how business is done, right? And so the first challenge you have in understanding context is figuring out where you're at, in, in where your company's at in their maturity curve, because that's gonna shape how you engage with those folks. But it's not just about design maturity. Uh, there's a concept called the leadership ceiling. Uh, we had on our podcast a gentleman, Tim Kieschnick. Uh, he had been at Kaiser Permanente, one of uh, the United States' largest healthcare companies, 300,000 employees. It offers both insurance and uh, uh, medical care. Uh, he'd been there for 30 years. Uh, he started their UX practice. He started KP.org in the mid-90s. Uh, he saw a lot of stuff. And we had him on the podcast, and he shared his idea of the leadership ceiling. And there's a lot that goes into it. At some point later, do a search on the leadership ceiling and listen to the podcast, et cetera. But for now, what I'll point out is the idea behind the leadership ceiling is is to recognize that um, your leadership is going to talk a big talk uh, about things. And so you might have leadership that, that speaks high purpose. We're going to change the world. We're going to, um, at Kaiser Permanente, there was this goal to improve healthcare for all Americans, not just those in the eight states that, that they operate in. And we're going to hire the best people. We're going to pay them well. We're going to get the best folks. But if you're not doing the work, and this is a big bureaucratic organization, if you're not doing the work to, ch to change process, to change how people work, that is going to be your ceiling, right? And so to be very cognizant of where the ceiling is that your leaders are providing. And the reason that's important is because you are th gonna think, right? Because you know during your job interviews or whatever, they're gonna talk this big talk and they're gonna say, yes, you can hire the best people and you're gonna think you can work up there. But you can't. You cannot work above the ceiling. Uh, you will only be effective below the ceiling. If you try to work above the ceiling, this was Tim's realization. He was this somewhat maverick entity at Kaiser Permanente. And every time he worked above the ceiling, he might get away with it for a few months, but he would get slapped back. They'd be like, that's not what we've asked you to do. What are you doing? Like, that's not, that's not your job. Um, so, so you need to be cognizant of where your leadership is placing that ceiling. This is a kind of conceptual, but because you are going to struggle working beyond that. But wait, there's more. Um, motivations. So this is something I, I came across more recently. Um, there's a book that my former business partner at Adaptive Path co-wrote with her husband, so Janice Frazier and Jason Frazier, called Farther, Faster, and Far Less Drama. Excellent management text if you're looking for a good book. Uh, 
In it, they had a sidebar featuring Hannah Jones, who had been the chief sustainability officer at Nike and is now the CEO of Earthshot. And it's a lengthy quote, and I don't have the audio the way I did with Katrina, so uh, I'll read it. Uh, maybe not every word. Motivation is the root of most human behavior. If you're not critical or judgmental of them, then you can start to meet people where they are and bring them with you as allies. Sustainability as hug a tree wasn't getting us anywhere. But once we framed it as a risk mitigation effort for the board, a financial benefit to the CFO, and a growth opportunity to the innovator and the CEO, we could start to pull levers with far greater power. Right? So uh, you could reframe this as, you know, user experience as customer centricity wasn't getting us anywhere, right? The, you have to be careful about how you're using your language with people who aren't motivated to understand or care about your language. You need to meet them when, with, with their language and their motivations. Know your place in the system, but know other people's places and benefits and why they are doing what they do. Make everybody else the hero in the story. So it's another bit of context, right? What is motivating all those leaders that, that are setting that leadership ceiling? What are their motivations and what are their distinct motivations? Because you're going to have to uh, navigate that. And then finally, you need to understand your company's business model. And for that, we're going to turn to my friend Erica Hall. The business model is the new grid. She's tired of designers focusing on superficial things like, like layouts and not focusing on the, 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 the substrate that they are operating on. Because the grid is not what constrains your work. It is the underlying exchange of value. There's no amount of empathizing with customers that will change that because ultimately your work will be deformed to, perverted to, constrained to that underlying exchange. Right? So you need to be cognizant of how value is understood and realized in your organization so that you can connect your work with that story. So there's a lot here. I probably should have stopped the talk now. But I'm not. I'm going to keep going. But but this is the this is probably the biggest, least understood work of a design leader is navigating this context. And one of the reasons I think it's so important, and this is me with serious face. Um, and I I wrote this in here just to make sure I said this note. This is why I object to facile think like an executive or UX metrics that really work discussions. They often don't acknowledge context, and when they don't work. The people who are doing that work feel like they're the ones that have failed. And I don't want you to think that you failed because you, you, you followed some UX guru's uh, advice on communicating value through metrics and your organization didn't care. That is actually more common. As I said earlier with design maturity, most organizations in that upper left-hand corner are not able to connect your work with value in any meaningful way, but almost all UX metrics conversations assume that you can. So it's not your fault, or, or that might not be sufficient. So you need to figure out, you need to shift your conversation towards one that they can receive, those motivations, all that stuff. And it might not be a metric story. OK. So there's a bit more. You then need to, once you've developed an agenda, un, uh, understand context, you're now going to get into a cycle. And the start of the cycle is you're earning trust. And you're earning trust because you've understood that context. And the thing you need to also recognize as a design leader is that methods and process will only take you so far. right? If you over, over rely on just being this, the, the expert um, in methodology, uh, you, your, your ability to lead will be stymied. Uh, at the heart of Earning trust is, is relationships with the people around you. And there's something that I use in, in my, uh, for those who attended my leadership master class, you're going to recognize this. Uh, there's something I use in my master class and, and also just with some of my clients, which is this concept of the trust equation. And the trust equation comes from a group called Trusted Advisors. There's a link there at the bottom. And the trust equation is that uh, trust is built through credibility. You know what you're talking about. Reliability, you show up, you deliver as expected. And intimacy, you demonstrate care uh, in your work and, and care for the people that you're working with. And trust is eroded by a perception of self-interest. Now, this slide has, is way too complicated to get into any details here at this event. Um, but I'm going to show all of it anyway um, because I want to impress upon you just how much work goes into building trust. So first, there's your team. 
a team of people. Now, I, that could be at any level. You might be a manager leading a team of five or six, or you might be an executive leading a team of 400, 800. Doesn't matter. Whatever your team is, you, the way you build trust with them is by knowing how design works, knowing, knowing the work that the team is doing. Following through on your commitments, I do a lot of work supporting organizations around things like uh, professional development and career architecture, right? So for your team, are you helping them grow in their career? That's a commitment you are making. Are you following through on stuff like that? And creating a space of psychological safety, right? So people can feel like they can be their whole selves and not be punished. But then it's not just your team. You now have these cross-functional peers in product management, engineering, marketing, sales that you're gonna need to work with. So for them, you have a different set of things you're gonna need to do to build trust, in particular knowing the subject matter, right? This is where methods and process only go so far, uh, where you really need to know the content of the work or you will not be seen as credible. Also, uh, under intimacy, you see exercise empathy. This is something we end up stressing in, in the class uh, quite a bit, where we as design leaders, UX leaders, are really good at empathizing with those end users and really bad at empathizing with our colleagues. <laughs> But our colleagues are in their own world of hurt, right? That, that uh, being drawn and quartered. Product people feel drawn and quartered. I can tell you that, right? They're getting it from all sides. They're getting it from executives. They're supposed to meet certain demands. They got to do things in certain times. They're being told no by everyone who's trying to, uh, uh, that they're trying to corral, right? They're, they're, their jobs are not, not stressful. Their jobs are, are difficult as well, right? And so you need to make those connections with those peers. But it's not just them. That all that understanding context as well will allow you to earn trust with your leadership, particularly that first bit, understanding the business, right? Understand the business model, connect your team's work to value in a meaningful way. That's also what is implied by showing your worth. Now, showing your worth can mean two different things, right? If you can run the full connection between um, behavior and value, you can show your worth in that upper right quadrant, right? Because you're in, a, you're in a mature organization. If you're in an immature organization, you still need to show your worth. Um, so someone that I'm not pointing out here, but uh, I'll, I'll mention is uh, Jehad Afane, chief design officer at Toast now. But before that, he worked at VMware and Splunk, very technical environments. And when we interviewed him for the podcast, he mentioned that he uh, couldn't use impact metrics in some of his in, in the environments where he led because it wouldn't have landed. They it wouldn't have made sense to them. They weren't there was no ability to connect to UX to impact. So he instead of talking about demonstrating impact, adopted this this frame of showing your worth. And the way he showed his worth was by build was by how his team built strong relationships with product and engineering that were measured by things like internal pulse surveys and employee surveys. And that was where he began. So his, the company he was operating in was immature, like they had design but didn't know how to value it. So he had to find some mechanism by which to say, my team is doing good work, you should listen to us, you should start trusting us. And that was how he showed his worth. So it will not always be some um, uh, MBA math Right, it's, it's, it might be something else that you need to do in order to, to demonstrate that value. Something that every design leader hates, most every design leader hates, is the reality that you are going to need to play politics. Right, we as design leaders, you know, earlier I mentioned having an agenda. And having an agenda means you have this idea of where you wanna go. And let's say that's that X in the middle, the, the bullseye. But your leaders are gonna ask you to do things that might be on the target, though not in the middle, and it's incumbent upon you, if, especially early on uh, as a leader, especially if you know, these are folks with power and you don't have it, to play along, right? To, to, to do the work that you might not think is most strategically important, but if that is what is being asked of you by folks with those levers, to use uh, Hannah's word, you do that work and then over time, you can start pulling that work towards as you're building trust from folks, you can start pulling that work towards your agenda. But if you try to go out of the gate with that, you'll just be rejected. They'll be like, you're not doing the things I'm asking for. Please do the things I'm asking for. And if they have the ones with power, you have to listen to that. But you also have to know that over time, you will be able to succeed. I'm going to blow past our time. Sorry, I'm seeing a countdown here. So that's earning trust. Now, congratulations. You get to lead design. Yay! You all go out, listen, now you get to lead design. I have nothing else to say about it because uh, the rest of this talk, all the books, everything else is about leading design. You can, you can learn how to lead design later. 
I'm talking about design leadership uh, and all the things that go around this, that enable this, that support this. Okay, so then um, the last part of the wheel is cultivating resilience because as I mentioned with playing politics, this takes time, right? You're gonna be, you know, developing an agenda, understanding context, that's fairly stable. This is then this process that, that the longer you stay someplace, the more trust you earn, the better design you're able to lead. But you know, I'll talk about resilience. The cultivating resilience allows you to build more trust and lead more better design. It's gonna be this cycle moving forward. And for this, I'm just gonna share some lessons around what, it, what, what do I mean by resilience and, and what are you gonna to need to bring to, those, uh, to, to, the, to the job uh, in the work you do. Tim Kieschnick in our interview with him uh, mentioned on the leadership ceiling, something that you can try to do with that leadership ceiling is change it. But the very first thing he said is, change is not for the faint of heart. So if you are signing up to be a leader with an agenda to make change, be, be you know, gird your loins. This is, this is tough work. True leadership is lonely. Uh, and something I've seen from uh, many of the leaders I work with is, uh, because often if they're the head of design, there's no one else who understands what they do in their role. Um, they seek professional connections outside of work. Uh, develop a community like this, like others, even if it's just a few folks that you're leaning on. Um, uh, uh, develop that community, people that you can uh, share stories with. Even though I'm a, I, I advocate pragmatism, that's the playing politics is all about pragmatism, right? B recognizing who has authority and power and that you're gonna have to maybe do things that you don't think are most important. Um, you can't lose that idealistic spark, right? You, you will, do need to maintain that idealism. That's gonna be that, that, that thing, that engine that powers your motor. Uh, I think that's right, uh, uh, to, to, to continue to do the work. If, if you end up being simply pragmatic, you will likely lose resilience, you'll likely get demotivated. So find ways to maintain that idealism. This comes from my pal, Lori Muzinski, uh, who I work with at, at Chase. 20% <laughs> better is still better. You're gonna be frustrated. We talked a little bit about this at our workshop yesterday, how designers always wanna have 100% impact. They wanna change everything tomorrow. And the reality is our impact is going to be incremental and celebrate that incremental impact, celebrate those wins. Recognize better is better. 20% better, 50% better, 5% better, it's still better. How you perform at work is not your worth as a person. Establish boundaries between you in your professional mode and you in life. And don't assume, like, yeah, establish those boundaries. Too many people get so caught up in their, what's happening at work that it, harms their life and their sense of worth as a person, of try to avoid that. Remember the serenity prayer. This also aligns with things like the leadership ceiling. The serenity prayer, um, I always muddle it up a bit, but um, allow me to uh, accept the things that I cannot change, change the things that I cannot accept, and the wisdom to know the difference, right? You are gonna drive yourself crazy if you're trying to make change on things that just are not changeable. Don't do that. It's not worth it. Uh, you can try to change the conditions, shift the conditions so maybe you can make some of that change happen, but you, you'll drive yourself nuts uh, if, if you, in that leadership ceiling mode, if you're just always trying to work above the ceiling. And then finally, time is on your side. Lots of it. You know, maintain patience, perspective. Uh, I've been supporting Chase now for well over two years. I've been seeing this, this arc of progress that, Day in, day out, month in, month out, doesn't feel necessarily like we're doing anything, but if you were to look back over the two and a half years since I've been observing this, like the change has been phenomenal. Uh, so, so make sure you're giving yourself that time for that reflection. Okay, oh, one last thought. I know I'm over. So there's, this is the work of leadership, right? This is the work between what's in the job description and how businesses are run. And the question that, that you need to figure out for yourself is how you stay engaged, motivated, power through all this. I'm gonna share my I statement. What, I don't know what will work for you. This is what works for me. Someone once asked, how do you stay engaged? And I'm like, well, you know, I'm engaged because there's this, this Trojan horse called design that all these companies want. But they don't know what they mean when they're asking for it. That's why I'm putting it in quotes. They're like, we need some design. And I'm like, great, I'll give you some design. 
But I know inside that horse is what I, for me, inside that horse is the sub concept of humanism. And for me, I maintain motivated because I see there's an opportunity through design to bring people back to the center of this conversation. That, 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 and so this is what motivates me. This is what gets me out of bed. That's what keeps me excited when I'm doing career architectures and writing role descriptions or whatever it is that, that I am supporting uh, uh, the ability for businesses to reconnect with the people that they're serving. That might not work for you. You need to figure out what it is for yourself, but make sure you have that understanding of what that kind of mission is that will continue to move you forward. With that, I thank you. I also thank my co-conspirators, Jesse James Garrett, who might be here. I didn't see him yet, but he's going to be at the event. And Lori Muzinski, who I work with at Chase uh, and did a prior presentation with. Thank you for your time and attention. That was amazing. What do we do now? Do Love the Trojan horse. And how oh, okay. you save the best for the last? <laughs> we do... I think we can we can try to squeeze in two questions. I, I can't see anybody. Okay. <laughs> Who has questions? Okay. Could get we to, get the mic in the front? I get to do this awkward thing. Hey. That's on. Hi. Hi. Uh, Who are you? My name's Emily. Hi, Emily. I manage the product design team at the Globe and Mail. And um, in your... Thanks for your presentation, by Oh, the thank way. you. It was heartening. So... On your slide where you showed the leadership ceiling yes. and you had process as sort of the top, I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about the process piece and how that makes it the ceiling. Yeah, so, I mean, this is all conceptual. When I, that leadership ceiling is very conceptual. Um, uh, but the idea is um, you'll hear from leaders, and they might even engage in practices of big purpose, big meaning, Big, um, we're going to hire the best people, but if the, but there's more to doing the work than that, right? There's how we work, and if they punt on some aspect of it, you might have a different leader who's big on process. We're going to transform and do a lot of agile, but we're not willing to pay competitively, so your people will be low. The point is, whatever is the lowest factor, and it might not just be people, process, and and purpose. There might be other factors, but but your your ability to lead, or your ability to do work is gonna be constrained by that conceptual ceiling that your leaders are putting on above you, right? And so kind of practically what that means is, uh, 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 well, so we, this is something we shared at, in, in the workshop yesterday. You know, you might, I, I work with companies that are in a cost-cutting mode, right? And so that's kind of for, forms this ceiling. And uh, if you are, as a design leader, realize opportunities for new revenue, for new for, for, for kind of innovation, you're not going to be able to innovate because they've set this cost-cutting ceiling. Like, that's what we're about right now, right? And so you need to be cognizant of, of the freedom, basically, that your leadership is providing. And it might not always be just what they say, right? And this is why you have to observe what they do to understand where you're going to be able to actually affect change and, 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 um, uh, and do work, <laughs> right? Kind of move things forward. Because uh, to Tim's point, you, you just can't work above that ceiling. You're gonna try, we're all gonna try. We're designers, we're frustrated, we're excited, we're in, in, you know, enthusiastic about um, potential. And we've all had that thing where we tried to do something and then we got smacked back because that wasn't on their agenda. So, yeah, it, when I extrapolate to, you know, my organization or maybe, you know, everybody can do that, you'll sort of think of like, what are the things that make up that ceiling? It might be like how budgets are provided for your work. It might exactly. be how, you know, the executive team talks only to the, each other and forget to talk down to the rest of you or listen or, you know, so it could be process, I guess, sounds like it's exactly. an umbrella that could be a lot of things together. It, it's interesting you mentioned... Um, uh, uh, how budgets work or, or, or those kinds of things. Marty Kagan, uh, I saw him give a talk uh, in-house at an organization about uh, product transformation, right? So he's the lead of the Silicon Valley product group. And one of the things he points out is product transformation is really, is actually very straightforward at the level of product design engineering. Like it, it's not that much work to change how those people work. He's like, but he's, he says he's never seen a product transformation succeed that didn't involve the C-suite because you need the C-suite to change how they handle funding for 
the product teams, right? You can't use chargeback models anymore or whatever funding model is. Or how HR handles career advancement and career development and skills building because you can't use the standard corporate ways of thinking about roles and careers in that model. And so that might be a ceiling that you don't even realize has been set because it's kind of out of your view until you start bumping up against it and you're like, why can't we, we we've, been, we've been trained on this new way of working, we can't get it done, why not? And then you do the work to realize, oh, because the CFO <laughs> has a different way of thinking about value than, than we do and we haven't made that connection. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Do we have Thank time for another or are we done? No, I think we okay. are. Okay, yeah. that was an excellent question. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let's have a big round of applause for Peter. <laughs>